Welcome you all on behalf of Chancellor Gray Little, who's here this morning with us, KU and the School of Pharmacy. And as Hank has said, uh, please, if you have a chance, uh, look around the building while you're here uh, to see the facilities that we have. We waited uh, 55 years for facilities like this, and they're well worth waiting for. I want to give uh, thanks to the Lawrence Chamber of Commerce for sponsoring this event, and a special thanks to Hank Luth for making all the arrangements. Our guest speaker this morning, as you know, is Congressman Lynn Jenkins, and I'm just going to briefly introduce her, a little bit about her background, so that uh, those of you who may be new to our Congresswoman Jenkins, who may be a new representative with the redistricting, you'll get to know her a little bit. She grew up on a dairy farm near Holden, Kansas, graduated from Kansas State University and Weber State College in Hodgson, Utah, where she studied accounting and economics. Following graduation, she became a CPA and practiced public accounting in the private sector before entering public service in 1998. After serving four years in the Kansas legislature, Congresswoman Jenkins was elected 37th treasurer of Kansas. 2002, a position she held until 2009. In 2008, Congresswoman Jenkins was elected to the United States Congress, where she represents the 2nd District of Kansas, which includes Topeka, Leavenworth, Manhattan, Pittsburgh, and the western half of Lawrence, the majority of Northeast and Southeast Kansas. Of course, soon she will probably represent all of Lawrence in the redistrict. She serves on the House Committee of on Ways and Means, the Chief Tax Writing Committee in the House of Representatives, and she sits on both the Trade and Oversight Subcommittees. It's my pleasure to welcome Congresswoman Linda Jenkins back to the School of Pharmacy. She's been here, I think this is your third trip over here, so welcome. <laughs> I want to thank you, Dean, for that kind introduction and for hosting us today. Is this not a beautiful facility? Uh, we are so proud to be here and honored uh, to have the Chancellor uh, join us. And we so appreciate all the good work uh, that she has done uh, for this community and the university. Um, I want to also thank the Chamber for being our host. And I apologize. We. Uh, I knew we'd have some walk-ins, but obviously we didn't know we would have this many walk-ins, and I think maybe they'll work on trying to find some of you some seating, and, but uh, we'll try to make do uh, with uh, kind of an awkward situation with those of you on the back. Uh, and finally, I want to thank each and every one of you for caring enough about wow. what's going on in the nation's capital uh, for coming out. Uh, for those of you that might be in the third congressional district from the east side, I'll welcome you to the second district. We have the honor of representing West Campus. Uh, you are one of the few communities uh, that unfortunately was split in the last redistricting and our state lawmakers will have an opportunity to revisit that in this next session. Uh, I do want to recognize one of those state lawmakers who I saw come in. Uh, Terry Lowe's Gregory represents here. Yeah. Uh, uh, some of this area uh, in the State House. Uh, so if you've got any questions for her, I bet she'd be uh, glad to answer those. Uh, maybe if we have some time at the end. And then I always like, uh, if you'll turn around over here in the corner, uh, way in the way back corner is Paul behind the little camera. He works for the Kansas Democrat Party, and he is the guy that gets to follow me everywhere with the camera <laughs> to record uh, every uh, second of every day in case I say something uh, inappropriate. He has the opportunity to put that on YouTube. So if you're brave enough to say something today, just know you will see yourself on YouTube later. You'll be a star. Uh, what I thought I'd do today, uh, we have about an hour and then we're going to move on to another Douglas County community, Lecompton. Uh, so uh, what I thought I'd do is start out by maybe just giving you um, 
some of the facts about the budgetary situation in Washington. Uh, it's always nice if we all start from the same point and then the old saying we're all entitled to our own opinions and boy do we have them. You know, I know we have folks from MoveOn.org, we've got folks from the Tea Party here, so we all have our own ideas, uh, but we're not entitled to our own facts. So I think we'll start with a couple slides that just kind of lay out what the facts of the situation are. And then I'm going to go through quickly uh, what the House has been working on as a way to address really the major issues of the day. And then I'm going to turn it over to all of you, and we will try to quickly move through uh, all of the questions, concerns, advice, and counsel that you might have for me uh, to take back. Uh, so with that, uh, let's look at some of the facts. First of all, I wanted you just to see what makes up the federal budget. As you can see, the green part is the non-discretionary or non-defense discretionary spending, and it's about 20% of the whole budget. And really, that's the piece that you hear us wrangle about all the time in Washington from year in and year out. All of the appropriation bills we do, we pass 12 appropriation bills every year, and uh, they are primarily uh, made up of that 20%. Uh, the other appropriation bill would, of course, be kind of the orangey yellow, the defense spending. That's the other 20% pie uh, that we do have an opportunity to talk about regularly through the budgetary and appropriations process. And then the rest of it kind of all lumped there together. That makes up about 60% of the budget. Uh, Social Security in the red, uh, Medicare in the purple, uh, Medicaid in the gray, the interest on our debt, uh, and other mandatory spending, which is like uh, unemployment, food stamps, uh, uh, so SSI for disabled, that 60% I refer to as autopilot spending. We don't really talk about it in Washington year over year because they're really, uh, based on current law, we just cut the checks. We rarely, uh, we rarely change them. And it's been shown uh, it's not uh, the politically expedient thing to do to discuss that 60% of the pie. And so if you're smart from a political standpoint, you would just assume ignore it. Uh, this is uh, a different way to kind of look at things. Uh, the dotted black line is our revenues based on history and then on a going forward based on current law. What happens with tax revenue projections uh, by the Congressional Budget Office, a nonpartisan group that budgets our numbers. And then as I, as I try to fill in kind of some of the priorities that we have for spending, you know, most people think that first layer of defense, the dark blue, is the main function of the federal government to protect us. So if we pay that and then we pay Medicare, uh, Medicaid, Social Security, the interest on our debt. If you see where we're at in 2011, you will see we're out of money uh, before we even pay the interest on our debt. So if you, you know, think back here, we could totally eliminate, totally eliminate uh, the green portion, uh, the blue portion, and really this year the, the interest, and, and uh, just then have enough money to pay our bills. So if that helps just to get your heads around uh, kind of the fiscal mess we're in. Uh, and I just wanted to show who owns our debt these days because we just surpassed 100%. Uh, we have 100% of our GDP is now borrowed. Uh, $14.5 trillion is the same as our GDP. So who owns that? There was a day uh, when uh, we held our own debt. We bought... Uh, United States savings bonds, and so we own we owed ourselves money. Over time, as you can see, that has changed, and today, 50% of our debt is owned by foreign nations. Uh, this is a picture of our debt throughout time, and as you can see, we had a spike during World War II, uh, then it came back down. But you can see this is just based on laws that are on the book. If Washington does nothing, uh, this is the problem. <laughs> this is what has everybody uh, in a tizzy in Washington because obviously uh, we have no uh, plan uh, to, to take care of that kind of debt. 
And every this slide shows every every year we put this problem off. It just uh, costs us more. So the time is now uh, to address the issue. And that's why I wanted to talk about just the Republican uh, House plan to address the issue. And uh, I can tell you what we, we are working on. Uh, obviously, we need to be more efficient and effective with our government. So the first thing uh, that our budget does is we cut, uh, even in the discretionary, even in the defense. I'm not sure that's ever been done before, but Secretary Gates came to us and offered up some savings. Uh, he felt that he, there could even be savings in the Pentagon. So the first thing we did is cut uh, the, dis the discretionary spending and then uh, the non-defense, -dis uh, discretionary and defense. Uh, the second thing it does is it, it uh, tackles uh, the drivers of the debt, uh, the mandatory spending, that autopilot spending that we saw on the uh, pie chart. And what is proposed is to take a look at Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid and make no changes for people who are 55 and older. Uh, the view is that those people have been operating under the assumption uh, that the current law would be in place all their lives and to break promises to them, the folks who are in retirement or near retirement, would just be unfair at this point. And so that's why everyone who's 55 and older is just set aside. But for those of us that are pushing at that age, uh, we have a little more time to react. And so the, uh, the thought is to make uh, basically two changes. And uh, one is an income adjustment for those of us under 55. So that we get the help to folks that need the most help. And the folks that don't need any help, don't get any help. And the folks in between, it's graduated. And so, for example, uh, you know, on, on Medicare, it would be means tested. So the folks on the bottom end would get the most help. And then the, the, we're not thinking Warren Buffett is waiting for his Social Security check or his Medicare help. Uh, so that would be eliminated. So there's an income adjustment. And then there's an age adjustment. Uh, if you look at data, it shows that on average we are living about a decade longer today than we were when those programs were created. Uh, life expectancy back then was about 70, and thank heavens today it's almost 80. Uh, so that's a good thing. But because of that, folks that are under 55, we would like uh, y'all to consider uh, over a couple year period bumping uh, that up two years over a, a certain period of time. It would just bump a, a, a little bit. And so we would eventually raise uh, the age of retirement two years. And then uh, those are the main changes. The uh, Medicare piece sometimes gets uh, misinterpreted and I know the word voucher gets thrown out a lot and there's a difference about, this is not a voucher that's being proposed. A voucher is when I give you a voucher and then you have to go into the marketplace and find insurance on your own. Uh, that's not what is in uh, our proposal. What's in our proposal is uh, income assistance, a premium support program, which is exactly what I have as a member of Congress for my health care. And the difference is, premium support is, you are guaranteed coverage. You don't have to go shopping around. You're guaranteed health coverage. Uh, when you come into the program, you would be given a menu of, a, of several uh, providers, and you would choose the provider that best met your need. And then the premium support would supplant the cost of that. Again, with the folks needing help, theirs would be paid for. The folks on the top end would get no help with all of the rest of us in between uh, getting uh, some assistance. Uh, so those are kind of the main uh, changes for the autopilot spending. And again, it's not uh, politically expedient to have this discussion. But I think from the debt uh, chart, you will see why it's so important uh, for us to have this discussion. And then uh, 
we certainly address the issue of tax reform because that's where the growth opportunity is uh, in our nation. Right now, the United States has the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Uh, so 